Um, so my name is Kaya Henderson. I'm the chancellor of DC Public Schools, um, and I have the best job. I always say I have the best job in the city. I actually think I might have the best job in the world, although it seems like working for Teach for All is a pretty cool job. <laughs> so I might have to revise that. Um, but I lead the public school system in Washington, D.C. And what that means is uh, we serve almost 50,000 young people in 113 public schools um, in the city. Um, we also have a system of charter schools in the city um, that serve, we serve about 56% of students, charters serve about 44% of students, and they've been growing over the last 20 years. Um, it's an interesting dynamic because for a very long time, the big bureaucratic public school district was completely unresponsive to the needs of students and families, um, which is part of the reason why the charter sector grew. And for 40 years, the last 20 of them really precipitated by charter growth, the DC public schools had seen precipitous declines in enrollment year after year after year for 40 years. I'm really pleased to tell you that that's not the school district that I preside over anymore. Uh, we're in our fourth, we're in our fourth year of, thank you. Um, we are the fastest improving urban school district in the country. Um, as our U.S. Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, would tell you, um, as evidenced by our scores on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, the NAEP, um, we have seen now our fourth consecutive year of enrollment growth. We've actually grown the district by 10% um, in the last five years, even against this um, ever-expanding choice situation. Um, our graduation rate is up 6% this year. When I started, we were at 50-ish percent graduation rate. Uh, we're now at 64% of our young people graduating. Our student satisfaction rate is at 83%. We think it's important to measure how happy our young people are. Um, and uh, by all accounts, we are moving very quickly to improve educational outcomes for uh, our young people across the board. Equity has been a huge theme of the work that we do. Um, Washington, D.C. is one of the most income inequitable places in the country. And so we see wide disparities in terms of um, student achievement, in part based on wealth and socioeconomic status. Um, and like everybody else, we're trying to close the gap. Um, but we're doing some interesting and important things to make sure that every single kid across Washington, D.C. gets um, an amazing education. I'm really happy to be here. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll try to tell you three things. One, just a little bit about how I got from lowly Teach for America core member to superintendent of the nation's capital school district. Um, I'll then talk a little bit uh, about what I've learned as a part of this experience. And then I'll talk a little bit about of the, ro the role that Teach for America has played in the total transformation of DC public schools. Um, so first, my Teach for America journey. Um, I joined Teach for America after graduating from Georgetown University um, in 1988. I, there was a lovely young man who was helping me with my luggage yesterday, and he said, what year did you do, um, um, did you do, uh, sorry, not 1988, 1992. Um, he said, what year did you do Teach for America? And I said, 1992. And he said, oh, that's the year after I was born. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. Uh, but indeed, it was a long time ago. Uh, I was in the third cohort of Teach for America core members, and at the time there were only 500 of us going to 13 places all across the country. And now there's like a booga gazillion Teach for America core <laughs> members going all over the place. Um, but I taught middle school Spanish in the South Bronx. Um, it was an amazing experience, and um, I thought at the end of that commitment that every single college student in America should do Teach for America. I was 24 at the time. Uh, and so I joined the recruitment team. And my job was to help recruit Teach for America core members. Again, 500 a year, which sounds so small. Uh, and uh, after being on the recruitment team for a year, uh, Wendy asked me to uh, take over the admissions team. So at 25, having never managed anything except a classroom and myself, uh, I was promoted to National Director of Admissions at Teach for America. Um, thank you very much, Wendy. Um, <laughs> it, it was the largest team at Teach for America, 
And it was also the team where if I didn't do my job, we didn't have core members, right? And so uh, I got under my desk and cried every single day and then got up and made it happen. I learned a ton about managing people. I learned a ton about um, recruitment and selection. Um, and I really began to understand in a very different way um, this human capital issue, how the caliber of people that you're putting in classrooms matters more than anything else. Um, I did that for two and a half or three years and then uh, Wendy asked me to move to DC and run Teach for America DC and I did that um, again, it was a place where I crawled under my desk and cried a lot because I was the executive director of a region where it was a very complicated school district. I had to contend with building a board of directors, fundraising. I had never done either of those things before in my life. Um, and keeping people's children happy while they were doing the hardest job over the course of two years after your college experience and um, it's where I fell in love with DC public schools. I had my 50 folders of my Teach for America core members and I walked into the district and I said, you know, I have these great young people and I'm ready to hire them and the people in human resources were surrounded by literally folders to the top of the ceiling and phones were ringing and there were these two ladies in there and you know, I was like, I have my teachers, and they were like, great, put them on the pile. And I was like, well, what is the pile? They were like, those are the people who want to teach in DCPS. And I said, well, what's your selection model? What companies, competencies are you looking for? Like, how are you making sure that it's the right fit? And they were like, listen, sister, if, if somebody calls and they say they need a Spanish teacher, we just pull a Spanish teacher. And if they answer the phone, we, and I was like, oh. And I took my 50 folders, and I said, thank you so much. I'm going to keep it moving. And. <laughs> I went out and I worked with principals all across the city and I said, hey, look, I have these great young people and if you partner with us to help train and develop them, they can be great teachers for you. And I got all 50 of my core members placed. And in October, the school district called me and said, hey, um, where are those 50 people? Do you still have them? And I said, no, you have them. They're teaching in your schools. Shouldn't you know that? Um, and so I, I felt like I was putting bright lights into a very dark cave um, when I was the executive director of Teach for America DC. And so after three years of doing that, um, I decided that I needed to figure out how to rewire the cave, right? Continuing to put these great young people into this massive bureaucracy didn't seem like the right answer. And so I determined that I needed to understand what superintendents were focusing on because they were not focusing on the thing that I thought was most important in my 27 year oldishness, um, <clears throat> which was the caliber of teachers. And so I applied to the urban superintendents program at Harvard because I felt like I should be trained as a superintendent. And then I could consult with superintendents and help them refocus their priorities on teacher quality. And so I had just finished my application. I got a call from a Teach for America colleague who taught in Baltimore in 1992. Her name was Michelle Ree, and she said, hey, I heard you're leaving Teach for America. What are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to go to the Urban Superintendents Program at Harvard. And she said, do you want to be a superintendent? And I said, I would never want to be a superintendent. <laughs> and that's so crazy. <laughs> she said. And she said, well, um, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to consult to superintendents and help them prioritize human capital. And she said, actually, I'm starting a consulting firm. We're going to consult to superintendents and help them prioritize human capital. <laughs> and if you come work for me, I'll give you a $25,000 pay raise. And I thought, hmm, job raise, school debt. I'll take the raise. And so. Uh, I got to start, help start the New Teacher Project, um, which is an educational consulting firm that spun out of Teach for America, where school districts were saying to Teach for America, teach us how to do what you do. And so I got to work with school districts all across America um, to help them rethink teacher recruitment, selection, training, professional development, and what have you. And in 2007, um, the, Michelle was asked to come to DC Public Schools and be the chancellor or the superintendent. And she called me up and she said, should we do this? And I said, of course we should do this. As consultants, um, we are trying to cajole and suggest and convince people to put human capital at the forefront. Um, but when we have the keys to the kingdom, 
we can show people what can happen when they prioritize teacher quality. And so um, Michelle took the job. I came to DCPS as her deputy chancellor and um, she wanted me to be her chief of staff and sort of run around over everything. And I said, I really want to create an office of human capital. And she said, what's that? And I, because we had never seen anything like this before. And I said, the problem is human resources people are dealing with day-to-day -day stuff, fires and sort of short-term uh, implementation things. We need space and time to completely rethink how we are not just recruiting and selecting teachers, but how we're evaluating teachers, how we're compensating teachers, how we are you know, really thinking about getting and keeping great people. And so I created this Office of Human Capital. Um, and Michelle, I did that for three and a half years. Um, the very first thing that I did when Michelle got the call and it was clear that we were going to do this was I called every single Teach for America alum that I knew. And we literally said, hey listen, Will you come to DC? They're gonna make an announcement in about two weeks. We can't tell you what it is, but just don't re-up on your rent. Like, come here, <laughs> live here. We're gonna do something really important and we need you. And people were like, well, what is my job gonna be? And we were like, transformation specialist, right? <laughs> Literally, every single person on our team was a transformation specialist because we didn't know how we were going to manage this school district. We didn't know who was gonna be good for what. So we just got a great group of people, brought them on and said, you're all transformation specialists until we can figure out what the organizational <laughs> structure is gonna look like. I'm really proud to say that eight years later, we started this journey on June 12, 2007. I just celebrated my eighth year at DCPS. Um, the vast majority of my management team are Teach for America alums, people all up and down my organization are Teach for America alums. Um, uh, the, my principals, a significant majority of my principals are Teach for America alums. And I'll get back to how this Teach for America um, foundation has played out across the school district. So uh, Michelle was actually, Michelle actually left the district in 2010 uh, after the mayor who appointed her was not reelected. And um, they asked me to stay on as an interim. And I said, sure, I'm happy to stick around for a few months until you find who you want. And very shortly thereafter, um, they asked me to stay on permanently. And I was not ever planning to be an urban superintendent. I really was not interested in being the chancellor of DC Public Schools. But the reason why I stayed is because after building this massive human capital machine where we have been able to attract lots of amazing people, I watched all of these amazing people sharpening their resumes and saying, we're out, right? This was gonna be good, it was gonna be great, but we know that there's gonna be a new superintendent who will completely reverse everything that we've done. And so we'll go somewhere else. And what I fundamentally believed is if we saw another talent drain from DC public schools, that we would not be able to ever um, maximize or capture the momentum that we had just begun to build where people actually believe that students could achieve at high levels. And so I stayed because my teachers asked me to stay and my principals asked me to stay and my management team asked me to stay. And eight years later, uh, we're producing, or five years later, I've been chancellor now since November 1st, 2010, uh, we're producing some pretty amazing results for kids. Um, <clears throat> Let's see, uh, what I've learned over the time that I have been leading DC Public Schools um, are a couple of things, and I'm really pleased that I could be here at this particular conference where the theme is further together. So I think one of the defining things um, about my leadership style is I actually believe that you do get further together working with people. Um, there's an African proverb, it kills me all the time when you see kind of the same theme happening from all across the world, right? There's an African proverb that says if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And in fact, uh, I wrote a piece about that in One Day, the alumni magazine for Teach for America because it really reflects the way I've, I approach leadership. Um, one, I fundamentally believe that our, our communities are assets. We treat them as if they're deficient. 
Um, but in fact, there is so much going on in our communities that is good and right. And if we harness it and work with it, in fact, that's how the best solutions come to play. Um, we've confronted some really difficult issues and some really hard things. And um, when I try to do it by myself, right, I get half a decent answer. But when I do it in concert with other people, we come up with brilliant solutions. And in fact, you come up with solutions that everybody owns. So when you're doing tough things like closing schools or when you're doing tough things like trying to figure out why your African-American males are not achieving at the same rate as their peers, um, or when you're doing difficult things like introducing a completely and totally new curriculum um, to shoot for higher standards, the only way you get that done and the only way you get it done in a way that lasts is by doing it with your community members. And so I've led um, with what I think is authenticity. It's who I am, and so who I am at home is who I am at work, it's who I am at church, it's who I am at the bar. Um, it's, it is consistent, and I think in fact, um, the world is yearning for authentic leadership, for people who, I was in the um, Teach New Zealand um, piece earlier, and there was a lot of talk about what you bring to, um, to the process. Self, your family, right? This idea that you come with a set of things, and I think that those things are assets and attributes that when combined with other people's stuff, you get to um, great results. And so I've tried to lead with authenticity. I've tried to lead with a respect for the community um, and inviting them to the table, giving them all the information that I have and letting us make decisions together. Um, I've tried to lead with creativity. Um, I think work should be fun. It is really hard, but we say all the time at DCPS, work hard, play hard. And I think that when people are enjoying what they do and not just grinding it out, you get better results. Um, all of the innovation stuff tells you that. Um, and I think one of the things that I've learned most is that you can really get anything done, anything done. You can get the impossible done um, when you work with other people. As Wendy said, if somebody said eight years ago, we'd be here, right, that we'd have increasing graduation rates that you know we have the highest first year teacher salary in the country people are flocking to teach in dcps there's teacher shortages all around the country and this year you we usually hire 500 new teachers a year this year i hired 750 because um, I'm requiring 20 electives at every single one of my high schools um, to ensure that all kids have a wide and broad set of experiences. Um, we hired 750 teachers. No problems recruiting 750 teachers this year across a backdrop of teacher shortages all across the country. Why? Because we've created a place where people know that there is a system that is supporting them, that is working with the community, and where they can be successful. Um, we have three pieces to our theory of change. Um, the first one is human capital. We need great educators. And initially when we came in, that was our entire theory of change, right? Just get great people, get great people, get great people. We got great people, lots of them. And what we figured out is great people need tools and resources <laughs> to do their jobs well. In fact, my teachers were saying, what about curriculum? We need a robust and rigorous curriculum. And so. Um, we evolved to thinking about a rigorous academic curriculum. And rigorous just doesn't mean, you know, reading and math, right? It means social studies and science. It means coding. It means um, art, music, PE, foreign language, library. It means extracurricular activities. It means athletics. It means teaching all of our second graders to ride bikes, right? Because not everybody has that opportunity. Um, so great educators, rigorous academic curriculum. Um, and then the third piece is engage students and families. When students love school, when students are engaged and motivated, when families feel like they can help their students and their schools, you get the best answer. And so we've gone from just get great people to get great people, um, provide a rigorous academic experience and engage students and families. And that's the magic, that's how it's happening in DC public schools. Um, I'll close by just talking about the impact that Teach for America has had on this work. 
we wouldn't be where we are in DC public schools without Teach for America. And it's not just because I hired every Teach for America alum that I've known forever um, to be part of our organization. Um, when I was the executive director of Teach for America DC, um, we, the city had suspended the school board. So this was the elected body that kind of managed the school system. They were fighting, it was terrible, and the city put it on hold for a couple of years. Um, the city then reinstated the school board, and a small group of Teach for America alums and I sort of looked around and saw that the same old people were going to run for these new positions. And we decided that we needed somebody like us to, in fact, um, run for the school board. Somebody who had some more knowledge about school districts, who represented the perspective that we did. And so a small group of us got together and said, we'll elect somebody. And somebody said, well, how do we elect somebody? And we're like, we don't know, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> and so we called some friends who ran campaigns and we said, come help us. And we got a group of Teach for America alums together and we were looking for somebody to run as a candidate. And we couldn't find anybody. And so one of the Teach for America alums in our group raised her hands and she said, well, since we can't find anybody, I'll do it. Her name was Julie Makuda. And in 2000, we elected her to uh, the DC Public School Board. Nobody knew her name before we started. And it was a seven person race where we won more than 50% of the vote. And it was because a small group of Teach for America alums decided that we were gonna do something about the governance structure, right? It wasn't a lot, we just took on one, but then we formed a group called Ed Action. And every year that there was a race, we ran a candidate. And so after Julie Makuda, we ran Victor Reynoso, who then went on to become the deputy mayor for education. Um, we ran Lisa um, and Robert Bob, and we ran a bunch of candidates until we actually had a cabal on the board to help support the perspective that we had. In addition to um, Victor being the deputy, a deputy mayor for education, we followed, we've had four deputy mayors for education now, um, and three of them have been Teach for America alums. And so um, our state superintendent is a Teach for America alum, and our previous state superintendent was a Teach for America alum. So literally, the triumvirate of the educational team in Washington, D.C., the state superintendent, the chancellor of D.C. public schools, the deputy mayor for education, and the vast majority of charter leaders are all Teach for America alums. It's crazy, right? Because we all have very different perspectives about how to get to the right answer, but we all share a fundamental belief in the fact that one day all students, at least in our city, <laughs> will have the opportunity to attain an excellent education. That kind of ecosystem has enabled a tremendous, tremendous thing to happen in Washington. And it didn't happen immediately. Teach for America started placing in D.C. in 1992. This is now 23 years later, and literally the entire educational scene in the nation's capital is governed by Teach for America alums. So for each and every one of you who are starting out this go-round with 15 core members or candidates or whatever you call them in your part of the world, I need you to understand that this is not just about the two years that your people are going to teach. This is not just about the kids who are sitting in classrooms now. Um, in fact, many of the core members who we have now are children who were taught by core members 20 years ago or 15 years ago or 10 years ago. And in fact, we're seeing more and more young people who want to join the noble profession of teaching because of their Teach for America teachers. And so the work that you all are doing across the, the world, literally, if it can change the nation's capital in the United States of America, it can change Nigeria and it can change Uruguay and it can change Russia and it can change France and it can change wherever you are. Um, it's gonna take a while, let me be very clear. People want something to happen immediately. I say all the time, it took DCPS 40 years to get to be the lowest performing school district in the country. <laughs> so it's not going to, you know, we're not gonna flip a switch and make it amazing. And that's, that's a, a, a conversation that you've got to have with your funders and that you've got to have with all the people who are measuring you. But real lasting change takes time. Real lasting change takes leadership and urgency 
and real lasting change takes doing it with people. Thank you.